try to wrap up my presentation in time for Q&A, but if we don't, uh, if I'm not successful in that, I'm happy to stand outside and answer any questions for you. You could pull up the slides, please. There we go. Uh, the reason that Capsida exists is to uh, solve the challenges and issues with first-generation gene therapies. And so I'll certainly focus on how we do that. And as the name implies, the foundation of Capsida is Capsid engineering. Uh, we take naturally occurring viruses, and I'll describe the process that we use, uh, and engineer them to particularly cross uh, biological barriers, most notably the blood-brain barrier, but most tissues uh, have other biological barriers, probably not as formidable as the blood-brain barrier, but nonetheless, uh, that's the main area we're focusing on, and at the same time, detargeting the liver. But even though we started with capsid engineering, we've built all the functions necessary in-house to develop products. We believe the most value-creating thing we can do for society is to create drug products that impact patients' lives, but also the most value creating thing we can do for shareholders is, uh, is to do the same. And so we've built preclinical capabilities, translational capabilities, uh, clinical, regulatory, and importantly, process development and manufacturing all under one roof uh, in order to be able to do that. And so we develop uh, programs by ourselves, but also in partnership with our outstanding partners that I'll describe. Uh, in a second. So the foundation uh, of, of the technology came out of Caltech uh, in the lab of Viviana Gradinaru, and, uh, and then Capsida was formed. Two of her co-collaborators, uh, Nick Flitanis and Nick uh, Godin, came over with the company, uh, and Capsida was born. The Series A came from Westlake and Versant, uh, and since then we've done a, done a number of uh, really important partnerships. Our first partnership was with AbbVie uh, uh, for three uh, neurodegeneration targets. Our second partnership then was with CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, that was really more an exchange of technology, their gene editing cargo and our capsids where we co-create uh, products in uh, Friedrich's ataxia and ALS. Uh, and then we did a deal with Lilly's Prevail unit for an undisclosed number of targets, also in CNS. And then we uh, expanded with AbbVie. Obviously, AbbVie is one of the world leaders, their Allergan division in ophthalmology. So we were able to expand into ophthalmology. And so there's a number of reasons those partnerships are important. The most notable one is, of course, validation, that these world-class companies have presumably looked across the landscape and have chosen to partner with us. Certainly, the resources that uh, those uh, partnerships have provided have been helpful, but also the expertise uh, that comes with those partners and unique cargos. From a cargo perspective, we've mostly focused on um, traditional gene replacement, uh, and so we've looked to the outside for uh, innovative cargos. We focused on innovation around delivery uh, and not so much on, on the cargo piece. Uh, and also this year has been quite notable, besides announcing our deals at the beginning of the year, we also uh, presented some outstanding data at ASGCT that I'll show you some highlights from in a second. And we also disclosed our lead program, is, which is for a genetic epilepsy caused by the STX-BP1 mutation. Uh, and then recently, just last week, we announced a partnership with another world-class uh, gene therapy company, Kate Therapeutics, uh, where we will use our GMP manufacturing facility to manufacture uh, their gene therapies. And so we have built around Nick and Nick uh, an outstanding management team that has decade, uh, decades of experience. Uh, we also have an outstanding board uh, with our two main investors represented by Beth Seidenberg and Claire Ozawa. Uh, we also have Viviana Gradinaru. She obviously stayed at Caltech, but she is on our board, so we have her great uh, insight uh, guiding us, and then we've uh, uh, been able to bring on board two outstanding independents who have significant gene therapy experience in Rita Ballas-Gordon, uh, and also uh, Frank Verweil, who was on the Avexis board and also is the chair of Intellia. I will also point out there's many things I'm proud of at Capsida, but one of them is also, if you notice, we have a gender-balanced uh, team, and I think uh, that that uh, certainly helps us create the outstanding results that we create, and, and so that's another of the many things that I'm proud of. So when I said that we exist to solve the issues with first generation gene therapy, I think these two images highlight that. Uh, so on the left, you can see uh, AAV9, and you see very little uh, expression in the brain, in, in this specific um, 
histology images from the cortex. And then as you can see with our latest generation engineered capsids, high degree of uh, expression in the, um, in the cortex and it'll show you in other brain regions as well. So the number one thing we focused on is as I said before, crossing the blood brain barrier, improving tropism, uh, but at the same time, uh, detargeting the liver. And so when you look at our results, when you take in combination the transduction efficiency uh, in the brain and at the same time the liver detargeting, we have a thousand fold difference uh, in CNS to liver expression versus AAV9. And because of that, we're able to use lower doses. Uh, we obviously are also detargeting liver, so for some, from a safety perspective, uh, that's a, a big improvement. And all of that enables us to not just be limited to ultra-rare indications like many first-generation gene therapies are limited to, but broader diseases uh, and broader patient populations. And importantly, all of this is done via IV. And certainly there's safety benefits to doing it IV, but the main reason we do it is because the best way to deliver our therapies is using the body's natural blood flow. Uh, the blood obviously gets to all parts of the brain uh, versus the CSF through uh, often, you know, uh, ICM or intrathecal administration. So we do it not just for the safety reasons, but also uh, because it's the best way to, to deliver. And so just a quick word about how we uh, do our process. We use directed evolution. We create billions, literally billions, of capsid variants. Actually, I should st step back. For every disease that we uh, approach, we create a target capsid profile of what are the characteristics that we're looking for. We don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. So what uh, brain regions are we trying to transduce, or in, in the case of other organs, like the eye, what, what uh, areas are we trying to impact? Uh, I'll focus on the brain, though, uh, for most of this uh, presentation. But what cell types, you know, is it neuronal, is it glial cells, astrocytes? Do you need, uh, you know, spinal cord involvement or not? Uh, and we, so we, we filter, we, we set that up at the beginning and then we filter these billions of variants uh, according to those criteria. So we're looking to try to find the right capsid that has the right profile for each of those diseases and at the same time we're looking at things like the immunogenicity profile because we have internal process development and manufacturing. We do early screens on manufacturing to make sure that we can at, make it at least as well as AAV9. Um, and, and so that's what we do. And, and one of the big enablers for us, and I think differentiators, is that we've built an automation and robotics platform. There's a video on our website if you want to see it, uh, that allows us to process hundreds of thousands of tissues uh, in NHPs uh, to be able to determine uh, that we're meeting the criteria according to that target capsid profile. And ultimately, we get down from the billions to that one single variant. And speaking of single variant, these data that I'm going to show you in the next two slides come from a single variant study from one of our wholly owned programs that we have not disclosed. Um, and as you can see here, let me just try to orient you a little bit because I think this is the most important slide. Um, so here is AAV9, and this is a CNS expression. And as you can see here, it's across brain regions. And you see consistent and uniform transduction up to 100-fold better than AAV9. And at the exact same time, uh, you can see that the liver expression is as much as 10 folds less. And that's where we get the up to a thousand fold difference between uh, CNS and liver expression uh, relative to AAV9. And I think this, these images really tell the story. So you can see, obviously, outstanding uh, expression in, in at least this image in the neocortex, and at the same time, hardly any expression in the liver. Um, and so this is what enables uh, all the things that I mentioned before in terms of using lower doses, in terms of going to broader disease states, in terms of, you know, uh, being across all ages. And these are some additional images from the same study. These are fluorescent images of different brain regions. And importantly, again, because of the tropism that we're able to get, but also using IV delivery in the natural blood flow, we're getting to deeper brain structures like the putamen and thalamus. And as I mentioned, we're using lower doses. So in this study, we're using 2.5 E13. And to put it in perspective, Zolgensma uh, uses one E14, um, and that just puts it into some sort of context. So even though we're using lower doses, we're getting much better transduction, uh, as the data I just showed you, relative to AAV9. 
and, and, and importantly, uh, in the thalamus, uh, we're almost approaching 70% neuronal transduction, uh, which is uh, a really, really important milestone, we believe. And so it, at the end of the day, all this comes down to clinical program or to, to programs that, uh, that will treat patients. And so we have two of them uh, that are wholly owned. One of them is for uh, genetic epilepsy due to the STXBP1 mutation. The other one we have not disclosed, but the data, as I mentioned, that you just saw came from that other program. Uh, and then we also have four, we, through our partnerships, we have a co-development, co-commercialization right for at least one of the programs which e with each of the partnerships. Uh, with, uh, with AbbVie, we have three neurodegeneration undisclosed programs. Uh, with Lilly, we have an undisclosed number of programs, but in CNS. Um, with CRISPR, we have disclosed those programs. Uh, those are Friedrich's ataxia and ALS, and, and that's what I mean. When you look at the genetic epilepsy, Friedrich's ataxia and ALS, it gives you a sense of the types of indications that we think are enabled by the results that I just showed you, because ALS, as an example, is an adult disease. Uh, we also have uh, diseases that begin in, in uh, in childhood, but those children grow up to be adults. So that's what I mean by broader prevalence and broader age ranges. Uh, and certainly the other undisclosed programs represent that same kind of range. And then finally, ophthalmology, that's a, a new disease area for us that we partnered at the beginning of this year. So we're just getting started in ophthalmology, but we have an outstanding partner that knows the disease biology. They know uh, the administration. These would be direct administration, not IV administration into the eye. Uh, but we're, we're, we believe with, we're with, uh, the world leader in ophthalmology in Allergan, uh, kind of leading the way. From a finance perspective, uh, between the Series A um, and also the upfronts that we got from those partnerships, we have raised a total of 265 million, not including the, um, the milestones that would come and royalties that would come uh, in the future. And so that certainly has enabled us to build this kind of platform, create these kind of results, be able to service those partners and move those programs forward, but at the same time uh, be able to fund our own wholly owned programs. We're not actively fundraising, uh, but you know, as a biotech, you're always thinking about future fundraising. And so uh, that's certainly something that will happen in, in you know, the coming year or so. Uh, but we have enough runway to get us through some really important value creating milestones with the programs that I just described. Um, and so finally, um, this is what we're focused on right now. We're focused on uh, advancing the two wholly owned programs and advancing our partnered programs. Uh, we're focused on continuing the outstanding collaboration with world-class organizations like Lilly Prevail, AbbVie, and CRISPR Therapeutics. Uh, we, we have the potential to expand in the future, uh, certainly in CNS. Uh, and in ophthalmology, but of course other therapeutic areas as a platform company with full rights to every therapeutic area. Uh, we have that ability. Right now we're focused on delivering on that pipeline that I showed you, but we certainly have that potential and we're always thinking about the future. Uh, and then finally executing. Like I said, we have a plan that gets us to really uh, value creating milestones and we're, focusing on, uh, we're focused on delivering that plan. Um, so with that, I'll conclude. I could probably take a one or two questions, um, and then certainly at the end, I'd be happy to answer any other questions. I will caveat it with, we are a private company, so I might not be able to or might choose not to answer uh, some of the questions and, and kind of retain the right to, uh, to leverage that privilege of being private, uh, but I'll try to do my best to answer your questions. All right, well, I'll assume that that was clear. Uh, and if anybody does have any questions, certainly I can chat afterwards. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.